the Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. Presidential debates in the U.S. have become bigger and bigger spectacles. Reagan's presidential plane as our backdrop. But a smaller share of Americans are actually watching them compared to the 70s and 80s. That may be partly because the debate format is not nearly as useful as it could be. It does more to create news than give voters information. While the Donald sniffed, Hillary shimmied. Woo, okay. Without having to confront one another on the issues, candidates can focus more on landing zingers. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. And less on explaining their positions. That is a mainstream media nonsense put out by her. Kathleen Hall Jamison and a bipartisan group of former campaign advisors are trying to fix that. Their first recommendation is ditch the live audience. He referred to my hands. If they're small, something else must be small. I guarantee you there's no problem. I guarantee you. All right. Okay. Do you hear the audience? Now listen to how it plays without them. If they're small, something else must be small. I guarantee you there's no problem. I guarantee you. The audience at home is being cued by the audience in the studio, and it's not being consciously cued. It has no control over that. I am not going to exploit, for political purposes, my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> like a sitcom laugh track, researchers have shown that an audience reaction can influence voters at home. This is my opponent's youth and inexperience. When the applause is removed, Reagan's performance rating drops. There's just too great a risk that there's going to be an outbreak of applause or jeering or cheering that provides enough of a cueing to enough of an electorate to swing a close election. The Kennedy-Nixon debates didn't have any live audience. Those were terrific debates. Since Nixon Kennedy, the moderator at every single presidential debate has been a network journalist. They're the ones asking the questions, except in town hall debates where the audience participates. What they do for a living is they produce breaking news. So what they're trying to do is advance a news agenda. They also produce news on the assumption that you've been following news for a long period of time. Well, most people watching debates are not high news junkies. They don't pay a whole lot of attention to news. Quote, one high tax, common core, liberal, energy loving, Obamacare, Medicaid expanding president is enough. You think you went too far on that and do you want to apologize to the government? Someone who doesn't live, breathe, and sell news might be a better proxy for the American public. And so we recommended looking, for example, to former retired judges, looking to college presidents, looking to historians, the thought being that they might ask different questions, but they also might think differently about what the electorate needs to know. In addition to asking questions, a moderator has to manage time and try to keep the candidates on topic. Two minutes has expired. Have said just because of the fact. Let me interrupt just a moment for, for you. Please, oh, 20 I'd seconds. I'd just like to respond. Please respond, then I've got to I will. follow up. Uh, look, I got him to give the birth certificate, so I'm satisfied with it. And I'll tell you why I'm satisfied with it. That was Because I want to get on to defeating ISIS. Lester Holt was the one who had to follow up to say, but the question was, just like she can't bring back jobs, she can't produce. I, I'm sorry, I'm just going to follow up, and I will let you respond to that because if there's a lot there, but we're talking about racial healing in this segment. Our thought was pull the moderator role back, increase accountability of candidates, and increase their obligation to hold each other accountable, and the moderator needs to play that role less so. To create that obligation, the Annenberg Group suggests a chess clock model where each candidate gets a chunk of time to allocate as they see fit. The chess clock model, the moderator tees up a topic, then First candidate who wants to take it would hit the chess clock, start talking. If the other candidate wanted to interrupt, hit the clock. My tax cut is the biggest since Ronald Reagan. I'm very proud of it. It will create tremendous numbers of new jobs. But what I have proposed would cut regulations and streamline them for small businesses. Regulations. You are going to regulate these businesses out of existence. What I have proposed would be paid for by raising taxes on the wealthy because they have made all the gains in the economy. You want to increase the regulations and make them even worse. I'm going to cut regulations, well, but I'm going to cut taxes big league, and you're going to raise taxes big league. End of story. Let me get you to pause right there, because we're going to yes. move into the Right now, the candidate simply interrupts, and the other candidate tries to continue to speak. 
Donald supported the invasion of Iraq. Wrong. That is absolutely wrong. proved over and over again. Wrong. In some of the cases where Donald Trump is saying wrong, I do not say that. And well, what is he going to say after that? I think it's I do important not say that. that he's benefiting by tagging the statement as inaccurate, but not having to take on any obligation to explain why. In the chess clock model, interruptions carry the burden to continue speaking, which might mean fewer one-liners, more staying on topic, and as a result, we might have a better idea of what they would do as president. If debates are good at something that no other form is good at, it's at getting both candidates on the same topic, saying things about the same subject so that you can forecast what they would do as president. You want the format to increase that likelihood.